the, uh, the title, I, I got an email last Thursday from my colleague Dale, they're looking for a title for your talk. And I'm saying, okay, well, what do I want to come up with? Where am I on the agenda? Well, I think you're third or fourth. So I, I had to come up with something that would keep people in the room that long. And, um, and I was out for a, a good long walk. And, and the other thing that, that um, was important to me, because I'm going to be talking about a real life uh, situation in a, in a family transition, is confidentiality. So I didn't want to use the names uh, of any of, of the family that I, uh, I, I work with. And so I transitioned uh, the, the two sons' names to Peter and Paul and the dad to Harry. Mary didn't quite work, uh, for those that uh, remember that, uh, that uh, folk group. And, and uh, Bill was asking uh, what was their number one song. And, and I want to say I'm young enough that I can't remember what their number one hit was. I just remember the, uh, the group. But this is a, a real uh, life folk story um, about a family transition. Um, David, I was, uh, you know, very captured by, by your talk and, and uh, I wish I'd known your mother um, because I, I have to admit that I received the strap um, on more than one occasion. And has anybody else ever had the strap? You don't have to raise your hand for that. Oh, there, there look at all the straps in the room. <laughs> you know, the one thing I learned about and I remember about the strap is it's not the first hit that hurts, it's when it wraps around and catches you on the back side. You know, it's like a Pirelli tire they used to use in, uh, in those days. Um, and <clears throat> the other comment about your, your mom that I, uh, I, I chuckled at was the die broke syndrome because I always tell our kids that the number one book in my library is die broke. I don't know if you've ever read it, uh, but basically the philosophy in that book is you give your kids everything while they're still growing up and can appreciate it, you know, and you can see the fruits of it because when you die, obviously, you know, leaving them everything at that point after you've neglected them for the previous X number of years doesn't, doesn't really work quite as well. So, um, so that was quite uh, interesting to me. Um, also, I, I wish Franco was still here. That was a, an excellent talk. Um, I, I, um, I disagreed with one point about you know, like having your kids like you. My philosophy with our three kids has always been respect you. And I didn't really necessarily care if they liked me. <laughs> um, and to me, the, the key thing with our children uh, is what I would call regurgitation. I'm at the age now where they're starting to tell me what to do, which is the same, in the same verbiage, in the same style that I told them while they were growing up. So, of course, they don't remember that. They just think they came up with this on their own. <laughs> and they're pretty smart. So, um, so that's kind of uh, neat. And, um, and Mark, that was a, a great opening uh, deliverance there. I've never met as funny an accountant uh, <laughs> in, in, in my life and an eloquent accountant at, at that. And, uh, but got a real kick out of, your, out of your talk. And especially when you were personifying with that gravelly voice kind of the patriarch of the business because that reminded me so much actually about Harry who is I'm, I'm going to be speaking of. In fact, I was closing my eyes and, and just seeing, you know, the same individual that was standing up there. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to explain why the name was irrelevant, that part of the, the, the heading in, in, uh, in a little bit, but let me first just put some context uh, to this. Um, the story I'm talking about, the, the family business I'm talking about, is basically a third uh, generation transition, uh, which is a, you know, a little unusual. I think um, some research that I've read anyway is that as you progress west from Atlantic Canada, probably in Atlantic Canada, they're, they're up to you know, sixth generation, Winnipeg, you know, fifth or sixth generation. Uh, as you progress west, it's, it's a little younger. Uh, but this was a, a, a third generation business started in, uh, in the 1940s. And um, I never knew the grandfather who started the business, uh, who had uh, passed away by the time that, that I got involved. But his, certainly his presence around the business was, uh, was well felt, you know, pictorially. And uh, it's about a... It'd be about a, a 15 to 25 million dollar uh, business, four locations, uh, retail locations, approximately 35 employees, 
and out of those 35, there were seven family members involved in the day-to-day -day operation, so about uh, 20 percent. I was uh, initially brought in as part of their strategic plan. They identified that they needed some, some senior marketing expertise, and so they went on the hunt for somebody that could give them a couple of days a week, often situations that we, that we find with uh, smaller businesses is that you know, they can really use a certain level of experience, but they don't necessarily need it five days a week, uh, nor do they have it in, in the budget necessarily to, uh, to bring on those types of uh, management. Um, so I was brought in a couple of days a week, and that lasted about a year, and then the CEO um, at that time um, resigned. And I can remember, uh, because my contract was in essence up, so I figured, well, the CEO is walking out the door, I'm probably the next car out of the lot. Uh, <clears throat> however, the, uh, the owner, Harry, came to me, and uh, we sat in the boardroom, and uh, he said, I, I want to keep you around, um, and, but here's, your job description is going to change because I want my sons to get more involved in the business. I want them to ultimately take over the business, but I'm not going to be the one to teach them how to do that. You are. And I kind of looked at him and I, I said, are you sure about this? And he said, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't feel that I'm the person to do it. And I think without saying so, it's... It's a little bit like, um, I can remember when, when my kids wanted to learn how to drive, and the initial instinct is, well, I'll teach them how to drive. I mean, I know how to drive pretty well, and um, you know, it's not going to cost anything for me to teach them how to drive. Um, <clears throat> but I came to the realization that, that maybe it might not go so well if I yelled at them at the first time they made a wrong turn. You know, uh, I wanted somebody, a professional, to kind of teach in the business who was objective and not emotionally involved with them. Because issues of transition are both emotional and practical. And you go back and forth, you know, when you're, when you're working with a family on those, those, those two points. And so without saying so, I think Harry was saying, you know, I don't want to kind of be the emotional uh, teacher of, of my kids, the business. I mean, and without saying as well, I mean, he was chairman of the board, he was the largest shareholder, so he, he knew he had the club if he ever needed it, but he wanted somebody to work with, uh, with the boys day to day. So my scope changed, and I spent basically the next four years uh, working with Peter and Paul as they uh, took over the business, which was very gratifying over that period of time. Not often you get you know, a situation, in, certainly in our business, uh, a contract where you're working with a business and a family that long. But it, and it was almost too long because by the end of it, I kind of felt like part of the family. And it was at that point that I thinking, well, I'm losing my objectivity here. It's, it's probably time to transition my, myself out. And this was a family um, that, I, I guess the analogy I would use, anybody watch Blue Bloods, uh, which is the the uh, TV show about a, a New York police family, uh, and they get together every Sunday, you know, and that's when they, they share everything. Uh, but Tom Selleck is the commissioner, and his one son is a detective, and, and the other son is a beat cop, and he treats them as the commissioner, you know, during the rest of the show, except for the Sunday night scenes, because he doesn't want to be their father, and he's not prepared to hear them ever leverage the fact that, that he's their dad. So this family somewhat reminded me of that family um, in, in Blue Bloods. Um, <clears throat> the, the two sons were, were very interesting boys, um, very distinctive, and anybody that's, that's had two boys, I mean, we have two boys, they're very, very different, so that part of it is not unusual. But in terms of transitioning and helping them take over the business, um, it, it presented some interesting uh, challenges because you had to uh, have them assume the right kind of responsibilities and work together in the right way in order for this to work. Uh, Peter had just graduated from uh, Ag College uh, in, in Olds and so he had a certificate. Uh, he was a very laid-back, uh, uh, empathetic uh, thinker. 
You know, he was not a type A driver driver. He was somebody that would, was a very deep thinker and would have to really as assess things. Um, and, uh, he, but he was, he was the people person. He wasn't probably as innately astute about the business. He was weaned into the business, inappropriately so, uh, driving around, you know, an old, I think it was a 65 truck, uh, taking soil out of the ground, soil samples for testing, because that's what you do when you're in the ag services business. And so he did that for about a year. Uh, the other boy, uh, Paul, uh, had graduated with a, a marketing degree from, uh, from college. And he was the uh, ready, fire, aim uh, brother. And uh, he was, uh, as I say, a little bit more of a business thinker, very up on technology, uh, up on global, global economics. Um, and uh, what he had been doing as a direct result of what Harry had asked him to do was doing a bunch of research, look up everything from what a farm is uh, to you know, grain prices in Chicago to whatever. He wanted him to learn everything that he could. And then he had him basically start up and come up with a business plan for a finance arm of the company. So instead of using third parties to, to finance purchases, for farmers to finance purchases, um, uh, they would create an in-house in -house arm to, to support that, uh, that endeavor. So that's, that's how the two boys uh, started out. Um, Peter became the general manager uh, as I took over uh, of the operations, the, the retail operations. And Paul became the uh, director of business development, if you will. And the other, another challenge was that um, Peter uh, lived right in uh, in the town where the operations were, uh, were based. And so he was very close to the front lines on a day-to-day -day basis. Whereas Paul was two hours away um, in the mountains and, uh, you know, with farm country a, a good ride away. Um, and that was because that was his, you know, personal decision, just got married, uh, his wife's family lived there, and that's where they decided they want to be and, and raise a family. Um, and Harry, being Harry, and this came up earlier, talking about independence, uh, he was fine with, with the boys going that, that route, but he held them accountable. So in the case of, um, of Paul, that meant if you want to live there, fine, but you're going to be here when we need you as often as we need you, if it means getting up at five in the morning and, and driving in. Um, so that's, that's a bit of the background on the, uh, on the two boys and how they, how they took over at that point. Um, what I found that, uh, on the, the other point at, of, of the industry at this point in time was that there was a lot of mergers and acquisitions going on and would continue to go on for the next five or six years and uh, certainly the Richardsons uh, have been a big part of that in, in the uh, egg industry. Um, but that was uh, creating a, a ch challenging economic climate where a small company like this one um, really had to make some tough decisions because if they wanted to compete with the big boys like the Agrams and, and the Viteras uh, and the Richardsons you know, of the world, they would have to be pretty nimble they would have to be pretty innovative, um, and they would, you know, have to be pretty smart about how they built the business. But they'd also have to be realistic, you know, that at some point in time, if they couldn't take out another company, they were going to be taken out. And so, so the family and and Harry and and Peter and Paul and I would have these discussions, you know, what's what's the exiting strategy? Where are we going, you know, with this? because there's two routes open here. And uh, in, a, in a few minutes, I'll tell you what exactly happened and how they were actually able to achieve kind of both goals, which is, which is kind of unique. Um, the other challenge I talked about was that with, with seven family members, uh, the boys were now the bosses for aunts and uncles that had changed their diapers 
as kids. And these were uh, individuals that were, you know, in frontline positions. Um, and they had to um, make some tough calls, and these were calls that, that Harry had not been able to make, even though he believed they were important to do. And so he left them to the sons with, with my help uh, in order to, to execute. Examples where one was an uncle that was not cutting it uh, in operations, and so we decided that he would have to move into sales uh, if this was going to work. And we transitioned him into sales, and I spent some time working with him because that's my background, and that turned out to be successful. Uh, there was another aunt and uncle that were both in, in senior positions um, where the, the end result you know, was not as good and it was decided that uh, they would have to be packaged out, which is difficult because not only are they aunt and uncles, not only are they frontline managers, but they're directors and shareholders. So how do you do that? <laughs> and fortunately, we, we were able to bring in some uh, assistance uh, you know, from our group in terms of handling the sensitive HR issues and compensation issues that were associated with that. And uh, the boys were able to successfully execute that and still get around the table for Sunday dinner, you know, without the bread being, being thrown around the table. Um, the other challenge was that Harry was, um, had more time on his hands because he wasn't involved in the operation of the business day to day. So that was the good news, he wasn't involved in the operations day to day. The bad news is he had more time to think. And he had more time to come up with all kinds of ideas about where, how to grow the organization and, and how to grow the company. And uh, he was always want to just show up in a meeting and with, with a new idea. And so part of my role was to kind of buffer between Harry and, and Peter and Paul and filter out the ideas and and try to ascertain what was the right thing for their core business and, and what wasn't. Um, I knew when I was sitting uh, in a bakery uh, in Calgary one day that uh, Harry thought would be a good acquisition, that uh, that probably wasn't germane to their, their core business. But, but Harry was a bit of a mensa in terms of how he thought about things, and he saw, well, from farm gate to consumer, the bakery's in there somewhere. You know, bakery's taking the wheat and making the bread, so we should buy a bakery. And um, fortunately, uh, that, didn't, that didn't proceed. Um, but he also had, you know, some other real neat visions. Um, uh, one of them was taking over a port transload facility. And, um, and we just about pulled that one off, and it would have been, it would have been huge. I don't know whether Agrium and Viterra and, and Richardson's would have allowed it to happen in the end result. Um, so it was, it was coming up with, it was determining what ideas that Harry had that fit the strategic plan that, that Peter and Paul felt they could execute and what kind of had to be discarded without insulting uh, Harry's good idea. The smart thing that, that the business did about uh, two or three years into my, my term there uh, was that they looked at the impact that technology was having uh, in agriculture and they started to develop some intellectual property around that in terms of working with, with farmers and making them more efficient and more effective. And to the point where it became a little business within a business. And at some point in time, I can remember the discussion and it gets back to do you want to sell this business one day or uh, do you want to try to retain it and, and what are you going to do to try to retain it? And, and be and continue to be profitable. Um, the, my point was, well, if we've got something going here in technology, maybe you carve that out as a separate company, put your IP in there. You'll now have a business that you can take key employees that can't participate in the family business on the other side that could be shareholders in this new entity. And that way you can retain them and you'll also have something that if one day you decide to sell the core business, you'll still have another business, you know, to carry on with. Um, and so that's what they, in essence, did. And about two years after I left them, they, in fact, did sell out to an American concern 
the core business and they did retain the technology business. And uh, Peter is, uh, as part of a contract on the sale, is working for two years for the American company. But Paul is running the tech business. And eventually, I assume that Peter and Paul are, are going to be together and building a brand new business entity that I suspect will surpass you know, what it is that they had in the first place. So, so that was kind of a neat thing. Um, research that I've read and, um, and other people you know, can probably correct me on this wrong or maybe they've read the same research, but Canadian companies uh, tend to, um, to try to extract value from their business, i.e. develop an exiting strategy that sells their business, whereas American companies tend to want to pass it on through generation and generation and generation. I don't know whether you've found that, Craig, in, in some of your, your talks or discussions with people. Uh, but in this case, they were able to achieve achieve both, which was which was uh, kind of unique. In working with the siblings, with Peter and Paul, um, as I mentioned earlier, it was important to assess their strengths and, and their weaknesses and have them working effectively together. Um, but also, uh, what I was trying to do with them, which is what Harry wanted me to do with them, was point out the potholes in, in, in the curves in the road that they couldn't yet see. You know, because those of us, uh, that had been in business for a while and got some gray hairs and made a bunch of mistakes, you know, one of the things that, that we want to try to do is save the next generation from making the same mistakes. Um, and so oftentimes those would be our discussions, you know, sitting around the table. And the challenge is getting them to trust you that in fact, if you do this, this will occur and it probably is not going to be pretty. Uh, but at the same time, giving them enough rope and independence so that they could, you know, they could make some mistakes and, and learn from it in, uh, in growing the business. And that's, I'm sure, uh, a challenge that, you know, that all founders and owners and, and, uh, and families have, is you want to jump in and, and rescue your kids, uh, both in, in life uh, and in business. And sometimes that's the right thing to do, and sometimes uh, it's not. I'm known around our house as a helicopter uh, parrot, so it's, uh, it's difficult for me to, uh, uh, to distinguish what, what is right and what is wrong sometimes in that, uh, in that situation. The other aspects where uh, we were able to provide some assistance, and I, I think this was touched on earlier, which is interim support um, on major projects. Um, one of the things that this company, this family business did, which other much larger companies uh, have had a big challenge in doing, is they implemented a new ERP, SAP system in the business. And anybody that's had any experience with SAP or Oracle or those types of initiatives know how, what a huge undertaking that is. And many companies like, like uh, Shell can tell you how difficult, <laughs> how difficult it, it really is. Uh, but the boys were able to work together to, uh, to make that happen. We were able to bring in a specialist to help them with that. Um, and they, they came out of it with uh, much better business processes and something that, uh, that actually worked. So you can accomplish those things with the right level of, uh, of support uh, in a smaller business. So I guess the... Um, my overriding thought about that experience and, and about what other uh, families in transition uh, um, you know, must experience uh, is you know, the decision about certainly when to, to make that transition happen. Somebody said earlier when, when uh, the kids are born is when you gotta start thinking about it. Um, I don't know about that, but I know in, in this case uh, it worked out well. It was probably left a little longer, but in the, in the sense that both boys had a chance to go out and get their education and be independent for a while, both boys had a chance to, to get some credibility from within the business uh, by doing other tasks other than, than frontline work. Uh, I think that that really assisted uh, their efforts when they actually took control of the business and then when they became uh, shareholders. And um, uh, it's, uh, it's a situation that, um, uh, that looking back, 
you know, is really gratifying to see what happened. I'm sure all of them don't go that smoothly, uh, but in, in this case, uh, in this case it worked out and, uh, and I learned a lot as well from, from watching things uh, transpose as, uh, as they probably learned from me.